Transcription activator like effector proteins or tail proteins are found in plant pathogenic bacteria of the genus Xanthomonas. And they're a class of DNA binding proteins which have a predictable DNA specificity. And these different um, effectively transcription factor genes, that their role in Xanthomonas is to activate. Um, specific um, host plant genes to support the virulence of Xanthomonas. Um, and a key reason for these domains evolving is that they have a very simple code and they're very easy to mutate and adapt. So if a plant changes the, the sequence of the promoter of these Im important host genes, to try and stop Xanthomonas um, functioning and infecting them, then the Xanthomonas can change the sequence of their tail proteins very quickly. So what do these proteins look like? Well, they have these large repeats in them called repeat variable domains, and they all have the very same sequence, protein sequence, with the exception of these two residues at position 12 and 13 out of this 34 amino acid repeat. And the structure of the repeats looks like this, which is a helix turn helix motif. And these two residues are what specify which individual base each domain binds to. So the zinc finger domains were good because one domain just binds to three bases, but the tails are even better because one domain binds to one base. So you only need a library of four proteins and then you can assemble them in any order you want to to bind to any sequence you want to. So all the natural tail proteins have very long arrays of these RVDs. And all these RVDs are very happy, they're very good neighbours with each other. So they're very happy to be assembled in, into long arrays to create proteins with longer, more specific DNA binding sequences. So here's the RVD code. So um, depending on what these two amino acids are here in the turn, N NI will specify bind to an A base, HD, a C base, and so on and so on. We've also got a couple here which are non-specific um, or bind um, to G or an A. So these are incredibly powerful tools. So uh, in the lab, you've just got fragments of DNA that encode each one of these four domains or these other sp specific domains here. And you just need to assemble them together into long arrays and then put them into a longer protein. Um, there's very nice crystal structures of them, um, which just show how they bind in that they just, again, uh, interdigitate into the major groove of DNA they don't modify the DNA sequence at all, uh, the DNA structure at all. So you've got very nice BDNA, uh, very straight when you look down the end of it. And you just sort of get like this propeller of, pro of protein um, sticking out from it. So very, very elegant uh, protein. And you can use tail proteins much like uh, um, you do with uh, zinc fingers. And, but instead of having a ZFN now, you have something called a tail nuclease or a talon. And again, like before, you have left and right proteins and you create this dimer. Um, so FOC1 will only cleave as a dimer. Um, and the difference in the architecture of talons is that more space is required between the DNA binding domains for the FOC1 to work. So you have a gap of between 14 and 20 bases and FOC1 cuts in the middle. So you've just got to assemble two proteins just like before. Um, but a key feature now um, is that you've got much more specificity in the complex. You've got typically 30 to 40 bases of specificity. Um, and the majority of tail nuclease proteins that you make do function very well. Um, I would say about 75% of the talons um, that you make will cleave very well. 
and they're quite straightforward to assemble uh, in an ordinary lab and, and I have done so myself. The kinds of breaks it, it creates, um, so uh, both zinc finger nucleases and talons, uh, create breaks with a four base, five prime overhang, and that's just what FOC1 does. It doesn't create a blunt end, it creates a five prime overhang, and you could use those overhang sequences if you want to in some strategies. Um, but that does mean that um, those breaks are, are a bit more mutagenic because non homologous end joining in general will get rid of that five prime overhang, and so you'll end up with deletions. So talons were first uh, used for genome editing back in 2011. Uh, they've become widely used in many species for a whole variety of editing applications. They can do everything that ZFNs can do. Um, it takes one to two weeks to make them in, in a standard molecular biology lab uh, using the tools that are out there. Um, I'm saying here half of talons have got good cleavage activity. I think it's more than that. It's about 75%. Um, there's a wide... Uh, the wide application of talons has led to many improvements uh, to reduce off-target uh, activity. So there's been new RVDs have been developed, which have got better base specificity. Um, there's mutations in the FOC1 domain to make it function as an obligate heterodimer, as I've mentioned. There are other mutations that improve the cleavage activity of FOC1. And there's been lots of changes to the architecture of talons um, um, to to make sure that it, it will only cleave when the space is a certain length, which again improves its specificity because um, an off-target where two proteins might bind by chance, the, 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 the spacing's not the same. Um, so uh, it's a very powerful, robust technology for genome editing. Again, there's, there's really nothing wrong with talons whatsoever. Uh, they definitely have their place uh, and talons uh, are being pursued um, to final applications in, 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 a, in a lot of different strategies. However, like with ZFNs, you've still got to make these engineered proteins. There's a certain commitment to, to, to making these engineered proteins, testing them and getting them working before you do any genome editing. Um, and this is the reason why they're not used so much these days, because um, there's an easier approach out there. So in summary, I think the way you could consider zinc finger nucleases and talons is that they represent versions one and two of genome editing. Uh, these te technologies are very well established. Um, they're proven. Um, we know uh, what the limits of use are. Um, these endonucleases, um, these engineered nucleases can be very active uh, and very specific uh, and they're, they're quite a small payload when you're considering how to deliver them to cells and tissues. Um, but there's, there's a sort of barrier to entry um, for a lot of people, which is that that initial protein engineering can be time consuming and, and expensive. Uh, you need to make two proteins per target and only a fraction of what you make will, will perform well. Um, and, and perhaps a, a, an, another issue is that if you're wanting to create more than one break or edit at the same time, so let's say you're trying to mutate two genes at once, or you're trying to delete a genomic region by cutting twice, in those situations, for two cuts, you'll need to make four proteins and deliver four proteins to the cell at the same time. Three cuts, you're up to six proteins. It, it becomes very difficult very quickly. So what if there was an approach out there where you could avoid having to make engineered proteins? And that's what we'll find out about when we look at CRISPR. Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments below what you thought of it. Um, please give us a like and certainly think of subscribing. I've got a lot more content on this channel, which you can see uh, in the playlists coming up. Thanks.